Welcome to the 2021 Earth Science Week webinar series, Water Today and for the Future. We are pleased to have four outstanding professionals that work with issues of water in human society. Today's lecture is groundwater exploration in response to humanitarian crises. Our speaker is Paul Bauman from BGC Engineering in Calgary. Today's lecture is sponsored by Geoscientists Without Borders. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I definitely appreciate everybody logging into this talk. And yes, and I, and I definitely appreciate Geoscientists Without Borders and AGI um, sponsoring the, this, this talk. Okay, so groundwater exploration in response to humanitarian crises. I began my career in hydrogeology and water exploration about 40 years ago. And I took a year off from for after my third year at university. I was studying geological engineering at, at Princeton University, and I was able to secure a number of internships in the Sinai Peninsula, that triangle of land between, between Africa and Asia. I was doing coral reef mapping off the East Coast and mapping of, of metamorphics in the, in the interior. And of all the geological wonders that, that I was able to see and, and observe during that, during that year, what most impressed me was not the amazing coral reefs or the amazing tectonics that are on display in the Sinai interior, but the, but the better ones and their seemingly uncanny but surefire ability to find water, to know where to dig water wells. And of course, these Bedouins, they did not have a geological engineering degree from a Ivy League university. They had no formal education of, of any sort, but yet they knew where to dig those wells and I had no idea. And it was only after many cups of far too sweet tea, sitting around campfires in the evening with the Bedouins that I, I gradually understood that what they were using was their traditional knowledge and really their, their very um, well-honed observational powers. So for instance, they could identify the darker colored dikes as being unweathered and they would look at their angle and how they cut across the, the, um, the wadis. And even though they didn't have the geological jargon, they knew to dig up, up gradient in the sands, up gradient from these um, unweathered dikes that they would act as essentially as, as dams. And I, I mentioned this one evening to one of the geologists, Larry Gaber, working on this project. And at the end of the project, he, he gave me a compendium of of papers done by the Israeli Geological Survey and, and of all in the Sinai. And one of those papers was by the Hydrogeological Division where they where they had used geophysical techniques as they existed back in, in 1980 to essentially mimic what the Bedouins were, were doing. And since then, that's I've, I've been completely fascinated in that and I continue to be essentially my, the focus of my career using geophysics to find water very often in remote places. And some of these, and it's been, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to go to some very remote places, including places I, I really had never even heard of till, till shortly after I knew I was going there. Even though some of these places, people far more well-known than myself had been there. And we'll begin with one of those places, uh, the Kakuma refugee camp in Northwestern Kenya. And it was here that the movie stars Reese Witherspoon and and Angelina Jolie had, had certainly preceded me. Um, but of the three of us, actually only two of us have, have made a movie at the Kakuma refugee camp. Reese Witherspoon made the excellent Hollywood movie starring, starring a number of Kakuma refugees, The Good Lie. And a short documentary, Finding Water, was, was made about the water project, about which I'll be speaking. Although we will mention Angelina Jolie uh, um, a little bit later in this talk. The Kakuma refugee camp was, was established in 1992 for the 30 to 40,000 lost boys that walked one, two, three years across the deserts, wetlands, uh, jungles of South Sudan to reach Ethiopia and then fled Ethiopia, fled the civil war there to reach the border of, uh, of, of Kenya where there were truck, bus, or walked 100 kilometers into the middle of the Turkana desert, into the middle of nowhere which in fact is one of the Turkana translations for the word Kakuma. So that was Kakuma 1, the original camp, and then the camp expanded into Kakuma 2, Kakuma 3, Kakuma 4, you, you see here in this drone photo I took, and then, and then Kakuma 5. Today, the, the population of the camp is about 220,000 
refugees and in 2016 when we did this project it was it was 165,000 uh, refugees and in fact most people in the world and, and including myself before I got involved in refugee camp think that most of the refugees in the world are going to the places that the media is spotlighting so they're coming to Canada the United States to to France but in fact that that's not the truth the reality is that they're fleeing um, civil war marginal places to live due to climate change famine drought etc and they're essentially walking out of these marginal lands to neighboring countries where they're somewhat better off so in 2016 when we did this program Kenya was the country that hosted the the fifth largest number of of refugees in the world in fact most refugees are in marginal lands and in countries slightly better off from where they they fled today there's about 80 million um, refugees and displaced persons which is uh, essentially ref refugees within their own country 26 million official re refugees under UNHCR care and in the Kakuma camp the the demographics of the population then and more or less the same now there were about 60 percent South Sudanese fleeing civil war in South Sudan about 20 percent were from Somalia uh, fleeing civil war drought climate change famine and the other 20 percent were coming from another 15 or so different countries also gripped by climate change and crises and and strife so Uganda Rwanda um, Burundi Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, Yemen, Afghanistan, and so forth. The camp itself sits on a flat, uh, flat sediment plain surrounded by vo volcanics. We're in the east arm of the East African Rift Valley, in that plain, the Lodokipi Plain sits in the Lodokipi Basin, the very southern end of the Lodokipi Basin. So the sediment you see here varies in thickness above the volcanics from a few meters to to many tens of meters and underlying that sediment of course being in the rift valley the east arm of the rift valley we have heavy normal faulting adding to the complexity we're one of we're in one of the largest closed basins in in um in africa and of course we have millennia of of um flash flooding of water accumulating evaporating leaving salts behind and then subsequent flash floods churn up those salts salinizing in a in a some in a largely unpredictable fashion the various um aquifers and the overburden and especially in the in the volcanic rocks on the left we see a, a simplified geological map of kenya and that peach colored lineament going from south to north that is the east arm of the east african rift valley in the northwest corner near south sudan we see that hem hemisphere that semicircle of um of blue with the Kakum that being the Lodokipi Basin, the Lodokipi Plain, and the Kakuma camp being on the southern end, southern extreme of that of that basin. In 2016, when we did our program, the entire camp was being supplied by 12 water wells. All of those water wells were in volcanics, tapped into fractured or weathered zones. All of those wells produced water of, of variable quality but all with high to very high concentrations of fluoride. The water is pumped out of the ground. It's treated with with um, with chlorine, drip chlorinator, and then pumped overnight for 10 hours into these large overhead tanks. And then the next day, um, the water is fed by gravity to more than 400 tap stands surrounding the camp. So a few hours in the afternoon, a few hours in the morning, hopefully, if everything goes well. And then uh, refugees, mostly young children, mostly young girls, line up in the early morning hours, often before dawn. Their 20 liter jerry cans, hoping the taps will run, hoping to get water so they can go to the UN run school, hoping they won't be physically abused or raped. So in fact, many young children abandon the lines and they go out to the to the lagers, that's a Turkana word for these ephemeral stream beds or, or waters. They go out to these lagers, dig scoop holes as they call them, and scoop out water that of course is not treated as high in E. coli and and other pathogens and as bad as the water situation is in the camp it's even worse worse for the host community Turkana whose lives largely revolve around taking their herds of goats donkeys and camels from one ephemeral water source to another so I'd worked in the camp um, 
in 2014 and 2015 for a few weeks carrying out a, a training course sponsored by a small Israeli NGO, Israel. And this um, training course um, taught refugees and host community to kind of about, um, about um, household water, water quality, manual drilling, hand pump repair, introduction to exploratory geophysics. And through my time in the camp, I, I got to see firsthand the, the poor water quality, the poor water situation and the, the minimal water supply that, that the camp was supplied with. UNHCR targets 20 liters per person per day, which isn't much in the desert to begin with, but in fact, they rarely meet that that quota. So after after these two um, training trips, I thought, well, maybe I can improve on the on the water situation there. So I applied for a grant from Geoscientists Without Borders, which I received, and then I returned to the camp in 2016 with a few uh, Canadian colleagues, and we put together a water exp exploration program, hoping to improve the water situation in the camp. And we used students from the 2015 2000 2014 training programs to to staff the program, and um, I'm going to introduce you just a very few to give you an idea who who these people are. This first one is is Loki Lowy, and she's a Turkana woman like all the students. She spoke at least three languages: um, Turkana, English, and Kiswahili. And she was actually a teacher, or well, is a teacher at the Angelina Jolie Primary School. And this was a school that Angelina Jolie opened up and I believe still continues to fund. And this school provides an alternative to, to refu refugee women in the camp, an alternative to early childhood marriage and a life without education. Laban Lucero, he was a child soldier in South Sudan, spoke at least four languages, very good with a machete, which in fact came in handy. Junior Kayembe, he, was, he came from the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, he, Led civil war there. He was three years into a geology degree when he hitchhiked and took buses over a thousand kilometers north to the Kakuma refugee camp. He spoke at least four languages and in fact a few years ago he received third country repatriation to the United States where he's working as a translator. So where are we going to find water in the camp? Well until 2016 all of the UNHCR wells had targeted the, the underlying volcanics. And, and instead of instead of looking for these deeper sources, we decided that that we would look for shallower sources. We have that here. We're looking down at Kakuma one. This is the older established part of the camp where the lost boys first came. You can see all the trees. You can see how the camp, the camps are sandwiched between um, these two ephemeral, larger ephemeral, ephemeral riverbed, Laga Tarash and Laga Nabek. So our idea was to look for paleo channels channels that would have been created in the past and and then abandoned that are, that are connected up to these larger lagers with the idea being that if we could drill into these paleo channels the water sources would be closer they would be less expensive because they would be shallower wells they would the wells would flow higher because of the higher hydraulic conductivity of the sands and gravels and they would hopefully be lower in fluoride because we were no longer drawing from from the volcanics, the, the general concept is that um, in the volcanics, water leaches um, uh, from these alkali volcanics is, and, and that being the source of the fluoride. This is a drone photographic image I, I took in 2016, just before our program. So, so again, what we're looking for and what we're theorizing, hypothesizing is that we have this anastomosing network of channels under the camp that are connected to these to these main lagers, and, and this is very important, this connection to these main lagers, because as you saw in the previous photo, the lagers are dry, but of course we need a source of recharge. And I knew having worked at the camp that in the in the fall you get for a week or two the the short rains, in the spring you get a week or two of the long rains, and, and I knew from a limited amount of hydrograph data and rainfall data, as we see on the the left, there's eight months of data from 2012, 2013. We can see in the top, when it rains sporadically, we get no accumulation. But once it starts raining continually, the wadis immediately flash flood. They fill with water. And then if we look in the lower graphs, we see piezometric water levels in the producing water wells at the camp. And we see those water wells respond immediately 
when we get flash flooding in the um, in in the um, in the lagas. So that response, of course, is happening in the volcanic bedrock. But if the volcanics are, are responding, then then surely if they exist, these overlying gravels will respond. So we use two techniques for exploration. First, we use seismic refraction. Seismic refraction is a geophysical technique that measures the subsurface compressional wave velocity, the velocity of the subsurface geology. And essentially, for to simplify things, wherever you go in the world, world, pretty much without exception, overburden is slow, rock is, is fast. So what we were hoping to get out of the seismic refraction is to simply map the top of the fast velocity zone, that is the top of rock, and therefore identify where the overburden was thickest, where the bedrock was deepest. And then we use the technique of 2D resistivity electrical tomography to, to image these overburden materials to identify where the overburden material was low resistivity, that is conductive, so therefore either clay or saltwater saturated sands and gravels, or resistive, which would indicate freshwater saturated sands and gravels. So in, in our two week program, we collected about seven kilometers of seismic refraction data and 12 kilometers of, of resistivity data. And here we're looking at the first section on which UNHCR drilled, which was shortly after our program. And the section, this resistivity section is about 800 meters long and 70 meters deep. The, high, the hot colors are the higher resistivity zones, the cooler greens and blues are the lower resistivity zones. And the red dash line, that's the 2000 meter per second contour. That's the top of the high velocity zone, the top of bedrock that we pulled off the seismic and put overlaid onto the resistivity section. And what we see, of course, the outstanding feature here is this pink um, resistive blanket continuing across mo most of the, of the section. And that varies from about 10 to 15 meters thick. And that served as the target for the first water well, Lucky Borehole 13, that UNHCR drilled. And that was screened between 14 and 29 meters. In fact, that was one of the shallowest water wells ever drilled by UNHCR in the 20, 27 year history of the of the camp. It was also one of the highest producing wells ever drilled at 40 cubic meters per hour. But most importantly, perhaps it was the first well ever drilled that had fluoride concentrations well below the Kenyan WHO US Canadian drinking water limit, the, which is 1.5 milligrams per liter. The concentration was 0.9 milligrams per liter. Um, UNHCR followed this well immediately after um, using the same model of targeting these um, shallow sands and gravels with two other wells, uh, boreholes 14 and 15, both of which were also very shallow, both of which were very high producers, 29 and 45 cubic meters per hour, and both of which also had low TDS and low fluoride concentrations. So. My guess is everybody listening to this talk would agree that finding water for refugees in the middle of the of the desert is a good thing. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. But how important really is it that the water concentrations for these refugees who have who barely have any water? How important is it that the fluoride concentrations are below these drinking water standard of 1.5 milligrams per liter? Well, in 2018 and then in 2019, for the first time in the history of the camp, the 27, 28 year history of the campus, the same small Israeli NGO, Israel established a dental clinic for one week each year. And you can imagine after 25 years or more without any dental care, um, they saw only the most serious cases, almost all of which required dental extraction. And what the Dentists told me is that each of those weeks they saw about 200 patients, as many as 70% of those dental extractions were directly due to fluorosis, dental fluorosis. Um, but is this actually, can we take this as being indicative that, that uh, of the camp being the cause of this, this fluorosis? Because of course, people came from various parts of the region. Well, in 2016, when I returned from Kakuma in a basement cafe in in Calgary, Dr. Annalie Coakley, the head of the uh, Calgary Refugee Clinic, introduced me to a, an enigmatic patient they had at the refugee clinic, Mohammed Hassan. 
And she introduced me to Muhammad saying he was a 40 year old man, but he had the skeleton of a 90 year old, old person. And he, he, they had given him the, the generally accepted fluorosis test. He suspected skeletal flaws, but they gave him the generally accepted fluorosis test of a urinalysis and he came up negative. Um, did I have any idea? So not being much for small talk, I immediately asked Muhammad two questions. How long had he been in the camp? And that was nine years. And where had he lived in the camp? He lived his entire time in the camp in blocks four and six. Blocks four and six are entirely and only reliant on borehole five. Borehole five has always had the highest concentration of fluor fluoride in the camp. But in 2016, it was oh, more than 10 milligrams per liter, per liter, more than six times the drinking water standard. There was no question in my mind he was suffering from fluorosis and then further tests. In fact, a million dollars of tests were, were done on um, Muhammad with especially the bone biopsy confirming beyond doubt, doubt that he had, he did in fact have skeletal fluorosis. And of course, these tests speak for the hundreds of thousands of other um, refugees that have lived and continue to live in the camp. Well, it's likely no surprise to most people out there that um, a refugee camp stuck in a desert area in a marginal part of a, of a poor country is lacking for water. But what we're now seeing for the first time in the, in the history of the world, really, at least humankind, is a global view of our groundwater situation. This is largely thanks to the GRACE satellites, two satellites that orbit the world, continually mapping changes in gravity. And what gives us gravity lows? Well, essentially, two Two, um, two occurrences. One, of course, is the loss of snow in the ice, and the one, and the other is is loss of groundwater. And what we're seeing is these these tremendous losses of groundwater. They're not only happening in desert areas, but they're happening in even some of the most water rich areas on the planet. So the yellow circle there is over Bangladesh, and Bangladesh receives more than more than 50 billion cubic meters per year of groundwater recharge. But at the same time, this heavily populated country of 170 million people or so withdraws more than 50 bill, 3 billion um, cubic meters of, of groundwater a year. So it's an overdraft. And if we follow that yellow line, that yellow arrow takes us to one of the most rainy parts of Bangladesh, the Technaf Peninsula. And here the rainfall is about 3.8 meters a year, twice the rainfall of one of the most, um, one of the towns in, in Canada, Squamish, that receives the high, highest precipitation of well, the highest precipitation on the west coast of, of 1.8 meters per year. And it was here to the Technaf Peninsula, almost a million Rohingya refugees fled ethnic cleansing uh, and gen genocide in, in the Rohingya crisis that began, the third Rohingya crisis, the most latest one that began in August of 2017. So following um, following our success in the Kakuma refugee camp, UNHCR requested that we do a water exploration program in four of the large camps that, that they established in the in the Technaf Peninsula. Most of the Technaf Peninsula is underlain by 500 or more meters of Miocene, boat, what's called the Bokabil shale. Not a great, not a great aquifer material. But nevertheless, we, we carried out our exploration program, again, using this technique of electrical resistivity tomography, looking for more resistive um, sandstone aquifers, as, as you see here, incised into the Bokabil shale. In fact, we found a number of these aquifers, as, as we're, we're looking at here, these two um, lithified channel sands. And uh, wells were drilled, and they, and they produced on the order of 20 to 40 um, gallons a minute, four, four to eight cubic meters a, an hour. So these are significant wells, but in the context of refugee camps with hundreds of thousands of people, this is not nearly enough water. So in fact, these, these results were, were discouraging. At the same time, we were doing this exploration program looking for deeper aquifers, deeper targets, Many dozens of NGOs, international organizations, church organizations, other religious organizations were drilling very shallow wells, four to five meters deep, um, using suction pumps that, that, that um, 
that have a pretty much have a maximum depth they can draw from about six meters. Of course, there's no chlorination in these, and and this this drilling and these suction pumps are being installed in a very haphazard and random fashion. You can see here, for instance, there's two right next to each other, and already when we arrived in in November 2017, there were already more than 3,000 of these installed in the shallow aquifer. So need, needless to say, by the time the first dry season rolled around, all of these wells um, also went dry. At the same time, these wells were installed without any regard to point and non-point sources of contamination. <clears throat> you can see these wells here are located in very close proximity to, to shower stalls and and latrines. And in fact, I was interviewed <clears throat> right here by BBC, where I unfortunately correctly predicted the imminent uh, occurrence of a of a cholera outbreak, which which occurred just a, a few weeks later. So in fact, I came away from my Bangladesh humanitarian experience very, very discouraged. And, and I was very grateful to have an opportunity in January to carry out a water another water exploration program, also supported by Geoscientists without without borders in the SCG in in northern Uganda. And I was very I was very grateful to come up here because here, um, all of the NGOs and most of the NGOs and most UN agencies had left the area in 2006. 2006 marked the end of what was um, then Africa's longest running civil war, running from 1982 to 2006, where the Lord's Resistance Army, led by Joseph Kony, battled the government of of Yoweri Yos, Yos, Museveni, who's still um, who's still the leader of Uganda. He won the most recent recent election, and in the course of that long civil war, Museveni, ostensibly to clear the battlefield, to clear the landscape, took approximately two million Acholi people, stripped them out of the villages, off the landscape, and put them into what were called protection camps, 251 of these protection camps. And this, this isn't that long ago. Here we're looking at a, a Google Earth image from 2006 in Atyak. And, but the, the reality is these protection camps were essentially concentration camps with horrific conditions, the highest mortality rates in the world, 1,000 people a week dying of Ebola, AIDS, malaria, cholera, and, and so forth. As the civil war began to wind down, NGOs, UN agencies left the area. Um, families, largely at that point, just women and children began returning, returning to the camps, rebuilding their homes, rebuilding their gardens, and of course they needed to rebuild their water supplies. Um, we haven't come that far from Kakuma, only Acholi land. The largest town in Acholi land in the north is, is Gulu. It's only about 300 kilometers southwest of, of Kakuma, but very different geology. We've moved out of the east arm of the Rift Valley and up onto the crystalline basement terrain of Africa. And this is the terrain that covers about 40% of sub-Saharan Africa and is home to about 50% of the population, mostly the, the rural population. Uganda, it's underlain by, by granites, gneisses, um, diabases and, and meta, meta sediments. Where do you find water in this type of terrain? Well, I, I had a pretty good idea because in 1999 and 2000, I'd carried out a water exploration program in Malawi in similar terrain where we'd sighted more than 200 successfully drilled water wells. And we went to that program not set on any one particular Technique. The first thing we did, this is in southeast Malawi, Mangochi district, we um, we identified about 20 water wells that had a long history of, of production, but were no longer functioning due to mechanical failures in the hand pumps. So we pulled those hand pumps and the downhole assemblies, the rising mains, the cylinders, and we repaired those at surface. And while all the mechanisms were out of the hole, we then took advantage of the PVC casing we logged three SONs that you can log in PVC, conductivity, magnetic susceptibility, and natural gamma. And what we're, of course, trying to do is identify a physical property that distinguishes the aquifer from everything else. And, and in these types of terrain, generally the main aquifer is saprolite. Saprolite is crystalline rock that's been chemically 
weathered in, in place. Essentially, the soluble mil minerals have been removed, and if in areas of high precipitation, the pore space is then filled with water. And what we can see very clearly on the, these uh, four logs from from the Nanyanga uh, village is that conductivity is the most diagnostic property. So we use that at the time to use 2D resistivity as our main exploration technique. And that's what we wanted to take to Uganda. And again, as we, as in Kenya, as in the Kakuma camp, I'd already been to Northern Uganda twice, working with um, IDPs, child soldiers, on introduction to hydrogeology, hand pump repair, borehole repair, as well as um, simple basic exploration techniques, especially 1D resistivity soundings, not just the acquisition, but also the inversion and the interpretation of the data. So these students, again, similar to the Bedouins, none of these students had Ivy League degrees. Most of them had no university education. Many had no high school education. But in fact, there were very quick studies. They very quickly um, picked up the nuances and the technique of, of 2D resistivity ex exploration. And I'm just going to show you um, two, uh, two sections from this exploration program where we, ta where we um, targeted about 20 um, villages, health clinics, and, and schools. The first one is a typical section. It's 500 meters across, about 60 meters deep. On the right, two thirds of the section, we see the warmer colors, green to red, higher resistivities. This we interpret as massive, unfractured, unweathered crystalline rock. And on the left, we have that wedge of blue coming in. That is our water saturated satellite. That was a target for our, our 22 meter water well, which is still supplying water to the um, to the uh, 150 or so person Dure, Dure village. At each of these villages, we collected drone imagery, drone photogrammetry, made a drone photographic base map. And we did this um, um, so because the, the students themselves at this point, this is this is this is four years since my first course with them. They were all in fact far more experienced, far better than myself at manual drilling and, and pump installation. So they carried on the drilling without me and my, my colleagues, but be certain that the wells were drilled in the right place because um, they didn't have fancy GPS, they didn't have fancy survey equipment. We created a photographic base map of each village, putting essentially um, the X marks the spot, the target on the photographic base map. So even without any survey equipment, they could clearly and, and quickly walk, um, drill confidently on the right location. And they use manual methods, very inexpensive. But in fact, these methods are great. They they're certainly slower than mechanical drilling. It can take two or three or even four days to drill a 25, 30 meter well in crystalline rock, but but you still have all the methods, all the steps of a of a typical mud mud drilling program. I'll show you one more section. This is a, a, a less common, but 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 very interesting type of section. Here we're looking again a 500 meter section, look about 70 meters deep, and bisecting this section. We have this hot pink vertical resistor, and this we interpreted as a as a um, as a unweathered impermeable dike, and in a very in a fashion very analogous to the what the Bedouins saw, to their observational knowledge, their traditional powers. What happens in, with these dikes? And we, we've we've imaged quite a few of them up on the upgradient side. The resistivities are much lower. The conductivities are much higher because the water table is higher than the downgradient side. And of course, it's the upgradient side that then serves as the target for your village water supply and hand pump, which is that what happened here. They manually drill the well, they put it in a downhole cylinder, the rising main bringing the water up to surface. Uh, typically, we collect a, a water sample, immediately do some quick uh, water quality tests on site, and then we'll take sample. And we took samples for more detailed analyses back in uh, in Canada for a full suite of major ion ion analyses as well as metals. And finally, we put a, a cement apron. Of course, the cement apron prevents the well from from being contaminated as well. It moves the excess water away from the well and prevents these wells from becoming epicenters for mosquito-borne diseases: Zika, chikungunya, malaria, dengue. No. No shortage of, of diseases in northern 
Uganda. So, of course, I've spent a lot of time in northern Uganda and a lot of time at the Kakuma refugee camp on the border with South Sudan, what's now South Sudan. And I'd heard many stories from, especially from refugees, about the horrors and, and violence of of this still ongoing, what was then still ongoing civil war in South Sudan. And I, I knew I would, of course, never, never go there. But in in the fall of 2019, the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, contacted me. And there wasn't a peace agreement, but it was a cessation of hostilities was sort of in place. And the Red Cross wanted to access um, an exploration program at villages that had been previously cut off inside rebel controlled territory and they wanted they asked me if i would if i would uh lead this program and i and of course i said sure so here we have a very simplified geological map of of south sudan in the southwest we see the crystalline basement uh rock that taupe colored um the taupe colored material and you can see that just bleeds up from uganda from the drc the cir central african republic part of the extension of this African crystalline basement. Then we come into this vast yellow um, sediment area, and this is a, 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 a massive uh, floodplain. It's called the, the Sud. Um, very little mapping, very little geological information. Sediment thickness is, is essentially unknown and extends over a vast area larger than the province of, um, of Nova Scotia. And this would be our target area, and we would work out of these two villages in the north part, Hat in Chul. So to get there, of course, the only way to get these remote villages, remote areas by helicopter, Bell 212, loading up with almost everything, all our geophysical equipment, food, um, small tents, mosquito netting. It was a real, real camping trip living off the bush. I say almost everything because we forgot probably the most important thing, our water filters. And we fly for three hours across the Sud. And although, of course, it's a wetland, there's always water. This year it was that year, 2019, it was wetter than most years due to unprecedented rainfalls and rainfall and, and flooding. And in fact, I found somewhat darkly humorous that when I returned in de December to Canada, a number of colleagues at the AGU conference in, um, in San Francisco, American Geophysical Union conference, they they sent me um, notes um, mentioning a, a paper that, that they thought I'd be really interested in. And it was a paper that identified that under, identified through modeling unpredicted small um, increases of methane in the atmosphere as being due to this um, large scale flooding in the Sud. And why I found this darkly humorous is having just come back from there, the this this these small ppm increases of methane were were not a story the real story was the the ongoing civil war in south sudan the the tremendous human suffering due to the civil war due to the flooding and the consequent famine from the from the flooding so here we're looking down at a typical village in the sud and and again like in uganda i did drone imagery drone photogrammetry over all these villages to be certain that wells were be sited in the proper locations after after the exploration program. And one thing you probably notice in this water exploration program is that there's a lot of water. And yes, it is the rainy season. Yes, it's, it's in flood, and those, it's not so easy to access these these water sources. And in fact, major tributaries to the Nile. And yes, there's a lot of crocodiles in those um, in those wetlands. But most importantly, most in, and most relevant that all the water you see here is very high in E. coli and other pathogens. There's no sanitation, there's no hygiene in the in most of the most of the sud. And um, and you have, of course you have open grazing. So again, we, we worked out of two villages. First out of the out of the village of Hat, we use all female porters, carry all our equipment, electronics, food for the day, batteries, various villages. And out of and out of Hat, we went. Um, we accessed more remote villages by with boats and crews supplied by the by the Red Cross. And again, the technique we used here, um, we were limited in how much gear we could take, so we had to pick one technique. We used 2D electrical resistivity tomography, knowing that we would have this indeterminate thickness of sediment, hoping to target 
of granular materials, sands and gravels in the um, relative near surface of, of these sediment accumulations. And the first number of sections, in fact, were very discouraging. All the resistivities were very low, um, all cool colors, that is high conductivity, clay from west to east, clay from top to bottom. But as we collected more and more data in the, in the 18 or so villages we targeted, in the end, we found um, sand and gravel channels in almost every single one with sections as, as you see here. The hot pink areas are indicative of, um, of sands and gravels. Very, very shallow, always occurring at approximately the, the same elevation, approximately the, the same depth, which is very fortunate because these sands and gravels at such depths are easily targeted, again, by manual drilling methods that, that all the equipment can be easily flown in, or even by hand, hand, um, hand digging methods of opening up large diameter boreholes to, to 10, 10, 15 meters or so. Um, after flying out of the Sud, I came back to Juba, expecting to go right back to Calgary. Red Cross met me with uh, three things. First, a, a gin and tonic, and then a, another gin and tonic. And then they gave me a map of, of Juba. And Juba is like, unlike any other capital city I've ever been to. Um, it has no electric grid. It has no um, sanitation grid. It has no reticulated water system. It's basically a, a large village. And, and the, this map is of all the different neighborhoods with the warmer colors being indicative of what um, the government in South Sudan calls, euphemistically calls, waterborne disease outbreaks. So you can take that as cholera. And of course, we know um, cholera epidemics, cholera outbreaks will increase where you have poor sanitation and hygiene. And poor sanitation and hygiene will be, will be more common where you have less access to water. So we, we did a, a one week water exploration program targeting these, these village, these neighborhoods with the higher using this, this map of cholera outbreaks to triage where we would target. And I'm just going to show you quickly show you one section through one neighborhood. And this is, um, so we're out of the Sud, we're, we're now in Juba, the capital, we're sitting back on the northern extent of the uh, crystalline, African crystalline basement. And this is the St. Augustine neighborhood, one of the more densely popular neighborhoods. And you can see it, Juba really is just a, a large town more than a city. And this well that, that was here was placed by an NGO that likely had very little geological knowledge. They, they almost certainly placed this well at this location because of the dense population, because of the intersection of two important, important streets. And they placed the well in a, in a location I never would have placed and probably no one with any geological sense. They drilled right into this outcrop of, of crystalline rock. But in fact, that, that NGO was, was um, probably smarter and, and certainly a lot luckier than, than I, would, I would give them, than, um, than I would suspect, because that well has been a, consistently been a good water producing well. And as, as we can see from the geophysics, it actually was a good location. They, they drilled that well into what was in fact highly, looks, that's the nature of saprolite. It looks, looks like rock, feels like rock, it's hot like rock, but it's weathered, it's crumbly. And we can see that that neighborhood is underlain by a blanket of, of saprolite. But what we also see from the geophysics is that we have an even better target 100 meters away where the saprolite blanket is actually 30 meters thick instead of 15. So that will be a, a more reliable source of water during the, the dry season, water levels drop and, and a second well there that will be targeted by, by ICRC that will relieve the severe pressure that's on that first well. Finally, and in conclusion, I'd like to step back um, about 16 years in, in my career to December 26, 2004. That's the Indian Ocean Boxing Day uh, earthquake and, and tsunami. And I was seconded by UNICEF to assess the impact of saltwater intrusion and begin the redevelopment of groundwater resources in Aceh province, where an estimated 230,000 Indonesians, mostly Achenese, were, were killed by the earthquake and, and subsequent, subsequent tsunami. Of course, this is long before the advent of, of off-the-shelf drones. And part of my reconnaissance, I, I built a, 
a kite, a kite, um, a kite flown radio controlled camera system for doing my own aerial photographs. And I took this photograph. It's of a tugboat pulling a coal barge that was pulling the barge from South Sumatra up to Singapore. And it got captured by one of the three large tsunami waves, lifted two kilometers and dropped right on top of the only coastal road in in Aceh, Aceh province. So cool photo, of course, but but why I took this um, photo was not for the coal barge or the, or the tugboat, but it was for the cliff behind. This was the first location that USGS scientists came to in Aceh following the tsunami because they wanted to measure the height of the tsunami wave. And, and this cliff was denuded to a height of 31, 31 meters. So of course, on the on the very flat coastal plain that, that largely dominates, characterizes Aceh, um, floodwaters reach far, reach far inland, as far as five kilometers inland. Aceh is large, was largely supplied by more than 200,000 shallow hand dug wells, all of which were inundated in a, and of course in a scene that was repeated all around the, the Indian Ocean. Following tsunami, Aceh and other areas, this, this photograph's actually from Sri Lanka, were inundated by, by hundreds of NGOs, um, international organization, um, religious aid organizations, and, and so forth. And, and hundreds of people descended on many of these um, communities with pumps, pumping the salt water out of these shallow hand dug wells, discharging the salt water onto surface, and then repumping the water back into the wells, repeating this cycle often endlessly until the wells would, would very often mechanically fail and, and collapse inward. So hopefully in this talk, what, what you've seen, one thing you've seen is that in many of these humanitarian crises, all of these humanitarian crises, in fact, you need a tremendous input of um, human resources, of money, of course, financial resources, and of, of logistical resources. But also what you often need often what you need is a tremendous input of, of science and especially geo, geoscience input. For NGOs and church organizations, of course, a, a shallow hand dug well, it's really just a, a hole in the ground. Well, for a geoscientist, it's a, it's a window to the broader hydrogeological context. There's no question with climate change and, and the various catastrophes that, that we're now facing that Indeed, humanitarian crises in the future will almost without exception require further and and extensive geoscientific input. And hopefully I've, I've shown you in this talk that in fact, even a little bit of geoscience has a lot to offer to even some of these large humanitarian crises that we're already facing. Finally, I'd just like to acknowledge Geoscientists Without Borders and the SCG that funded the uh, Kakuma and Acholiland uh, projects, my colleagues at BGC that, that work with me on, on the, all of these projects, uh, the Kakuma refugee, Turkana, and the Acholi crews that, that staff the, those two projects. Um, ISRA aid that, that provided logistical support in Acholi land and the Kakuma refugee camp, UNHCR that supported the, the Rohingya project, uh, ICRC, and groundwater relief that supported the uh, South Sudan uh, and, and Juba water exploration projects. And, and finally, I'd like to, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Pat Morrow, Josie Bowman, and Junior Olak, who, uh, who supplied me with a few of the photos that I use in this talk. In the, in the Kakuma camp, you know, we often think of, of refugees, especially in East Africa, being all goat herders and camel herders, but I've met yoga instructors and geoscientists and doctors and aircraft pilots and there's probably more than 50 languages spoken in, in Kakuma, but everyone speaks the lingua franca of um, Kiswahili. And, and so thank you very much, uh, Zitsen Swahili Asante Sana. And I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions if there was time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. That was that a was great talk. We are going to go ahead and open the floor to questions now. I'll go ahead and get us started with a question. Um, so these groundwater exploration projects you've done, 
are the results of providing water to these communities more long-term or short-term? Or in other words, how much water are we talking about and for about how long does it usually last? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, sustainability is 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 always the question. Um, and and in fact, all pretty much all all the programs I talked about, I I, I do have some updates. But I'll just I'll just describe a, a few in in particular. First of all, South Sudan, um, um, ICRC has not drilled the the wells in the Sud yet because of the pandemic. They haven't been able to to enter in Kakuma. All of those three, all those, th what, one thing I, I didn't mention, those three wells that were drilled, um, 40, 29, 45 cubic meters, at the UNHCR quote of 20 liters per person per day, that's enough water for 60,000 people. Those three wells are all still functioning. And actually, I, I was in communication with the head of water and sanitation at Kakuma yesterday. They're all still functioning, and they've gone on to drill three more using using that same model um so yeah those are those are long-term wells um it's in, it's interesting though what there, there's other there's factors of course that uh these days that that have to, you have to put caveats in that question because um northern uganda northern turkana are on the front lines of cl climate change and what might have been sustainable well in the in the past it's not so clear with precipitation patterns changing that those wells will continue to pump. I can also tell you that all of the wells in um, in northern Uganda that we drilled are still functioning at well and as well. And I know that because there's an ongoing um, there's an ongoing water assessment um, survey right now. Typically hand pumps, it's it's a very it's a huge topic, tons of papers, tons of studies coming out now. It's a huge topic. Hand pumps are the most common water supply in villages in, in Africa, especially East Africa. Um, the, real, the reality is, um, it, overall, it's probably about half of the hand pumps drilled in East Africa are simply not functioning. In many countries, it's, it's much more. And there's all kinds of reasons why, why they're not, not functioning. Lack of maintenance, corrosive water, um, lack of know-how, how to use them, lack of parts, etc. So, you know, I've certainly done my best to um, learn from other people's mistakes. Um, but of course, all the wells I've put in were, have all been in Uganda. Have all been since um, 2015 was the, was the first one. So we'll see how well I do in the future. I'm going back in in January of this year. I'll be checking on doing further checks on other wells. I've been doing and, and hopefully putting in some longer term monitoring systems. So so the the short of the answer is yes, all the systems I've personally put in have been designed for the long term and hopefully to be sustainable. Okay, that was great, thank you. Um, it looks like we have another question. So do you see increasing use of solar energy for pumping groundwater? That's a that's another really good question, and um, and and I'm sure there's lots of people out there looking at this talk, thinking, why are they putting hand pumps? You know, Africa, there's all kinds of solar energy, there's all kinds of solar pumps. Um, people are using solar pumps in Africa. People are using them in these crystalline basement trains. Why aren't we? And and again, almost everything to do with water in Africa. It's a, it's a complicated answer, um, but I'll give you a, a, a few points of that. Um, first of all, um, crystalline basement Africa, aquas and crystalline basement Africa, they're, they're not great producers in general. And much of Africa, and, and certainly much of Uganda, you just can't get enough production to make a solar pump worthwhile. Secondly, um, people look at solar pumps and think, wow, this is so easy. Solar pump, put it up in a tower, hook it up, away you go. And, and it's not so simple. You need a battery, you need maintenance. People steal the pumps, the, people, people steal the panels. They have to be fenced in. Um, you know, it rains, you have a rainy season, you get clouds. Um, and, and the reality is that there's been a few recent studies that have come up that in terms of maintenance, if you look at motorized pumps, diesel powered pumps, solar pumps, hand pumps, 
the types of pumps that have the longest sustainability that are best maintained are the, are the simple hand pumps. And, and I guess a third, a third point I'll make is that solar pumps are often thrown in because they can be. And they say, well, if a hand pump is good, a solar pump is better. And then we can put water in tanks, store it, um, um, have irrigation and so forth. And, and many of these projects have come to the realization that I, I first noted is that the aquifers simply do not produce enough enough water. So um, it's it's still more complicated to that. And, and solar absolutely has it has its role, but it's not the um, obvious no brainer that that you know even I I thought initially before I really got my hands dirty in some of these projects. All right, thank you for that answer. Um, um, I see someone asked about um, saline water, and 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 yes, I, absolutely. Um, Northern Uganda, not not really. Um, there are some zones of somewhat higher salinity, but certainly in in Rift Valley environments, yes, um, saline and even brine, briny water is is definitely a, um, uh, something to be avoided and something often accounted be, because of the these paleo um, salt flats that that were created and then trend up and sal salinize the aquifers. So we, um, so yes, I mean, that's one of the, certainly one of the outcomes of resistivity is, is not only does it help you identify where to drill, but it certainly does a fantastic job of telling you where not to drill as, as saline, especially briny aquifers will have very, very low resistivity. It'll be very clear. Um, in aquifers that produce high fluoride, can villages install treatment systems to manage it? Also a complicated question. And 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 certainly UNHCR, for instance, in the Kahuma camp, where they have, you know, they have a, these refugee camps, they don't have endless budgets, but they have more bu budget than a, a small village. They've tried this. It's not so easy, because um, these fluoride treatment systems, they require power, they require maintenance, they usually have an exchange system and they require monitoring and even even analyzing for fluoride in the field is, is not easy so sometimes it is the only is the only option but but and of course partly i'm biased by by what i'm good at which is finding water but 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 generally i i would suggest in most of these natural contaminated site content natural groundwater contamination circumstances whether it's arsenic in bangladesh or fluoride in the rift valley more often than not, even in the desert, I would say find another find another aquifer. Um, that that would be my that would be my initial first um, suggestion. Um, okay, thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so, how about what is your background and how did you get into this specific type of work? Yeah, that's a. Uh, um, it's also a really good question, and I, I certainly get that, especially from students, quite a bit. Um, I mean, this is actually what I, I kind of always wanted wanted to do, and having and even, but even, I can tell you, even with a, a geological engineering degree from Princeton, a master's in hydrogeology from from Waterloo, it, it's not an easy nut to crack to get into this um, humanitarian type of work, even on a on a volunteer basis, and and. Most of the projects I, I just talked about were, were done in a pro bono basis. Why? Um, it's very much of a, you know, I, I don't want to make it too black and white, but but yeah, it's very much of a closed shop. The NGO world, the humanitarian workspace, um, you know, I, I think it's no secret the UN, which funds a lot of these projects and certainly UNHCR which, and, and UNICEF and UNDP that, that run a lot of the bigger programs and manage the essentially all the large refugee camps in the world, it, it's a tough space to to get into regardless of your um, your, your qualifications, your background. And, and really the, the short of how I got into it was um, just, you know, working my way and, and through opportunities, getting on one project, having a, some success and having one project lead to another project and and getting to know on a personal basis um, people in the UN, people in NGOs, people in in country. Um, it's it's a lot harder than than it should be, and a lot harder than than you might 
think it would be to to actually get involved in these these projects even on a pro bono basis having said what i i just said i i think that's going to change and and even the pandemic this pandemic that we're all suffering through is is part of it because um why because the situations in, in as we all know, the situation in these camps because of global warming, strife, civil war are becoming more and more more dire um, and climate change, of, of course. NGOs, UN agencies, they have less and less money. And the pandemic has forced many of these many of these agencies, they put them in the position where they can't send, you know, essentially expensive expatriate staff that might not even be particularly more qualified than 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 local staff often these wash personnel and usually these wash personnel and doing these water programs with NGOs very rarely do they come from a geology or hydrogeology background more commonly they're from a, a public health background or maybe even a logistics background with no um, geology background and and the fact that there's only so much money around the 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 program is becoming more and more important. The situation becoming more and more dire. I think we we are going to see an increased professionalization of the what is called the wash world, water, sanitation, hygiene world, and more opportunities for people with the proper um, professional backgrounds. Great, thanks for that. Okay, well that's about all we have time for today. Thank you everyone for the excellent questions and thank you Paul for presenting today. Also, thank you again to Geoscientists Without Borders for supporting today's webinar. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much Paul for sharing your time, expertise and insights with us. Thanks again everyone.